Hi everyone, it's Marshall here again. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. I just got done watching uh, a video from my favorite martial artist YouTuber, Ramsey Dewey. Shout out to the coach, keep doing what you're doing. I'll get out there and train after I'm done doing this video. And he sat down and answered the top 50 questions related to MMA as written on Quora. I thought, why not? Let's do the exact same thing. Let's find the top however many questions related to swords on Quora and answer them. Now, I am not Matt Easton. I am not from the Oakshot Institute. Uh, so what authority do I have to answer questions? I'm a sword nerd. Uh, I describe myself as a backyard cutter and a backyard historian. Um, again, I'm no fencer by any stretch. I have done uh, research in sword dynamics. I continue to do so, cataloging antiques and reproductions. And I've produced some infographics that some people have found helpful online. Uh, so using that as a metric, I'll go ahead and put my own opinion on these questions, and we'll see if anyone finds them useful. So we're going to go ahead and answer maybe the top 25 or so questions related to swords on Quora. I've taken a quick preview. I haven't read all of the questions, but I've seen that in many cases they're using sword in a metaphorical sense rather than a literal object. So we'll gloss over ones where it's not relevant to what I actually study. Um, let's see how many times we come up with katana. We'll put a katana counter up on the screen. Question number one, what's the most powerful sword ever? I don't even know how to answer that question, so already I'm stumped. There is no such thing as the most powerful sword ever unless you're playing something like a video game or a role-playing game. Historically speaking, there was no most powerful sword ever because power is not a measurement that you use when you're evaluating actual swords. Number two, what is your review of Sword Art Online? Sword Art Online is a Japanese light novel series. I have not read it, so I do not have any opinion on Sword Art Online. Question number three, what is a better weapon, a battle axe or a sword? I'm not going to answer this particular question directly. Um, there's probably going to be several questions on here asking what is better, X or Y? This particular one is phrased a little too loosely. We don't have enough information to really compare it. If future questions give us more information to go on, better context, to quote Matt Easton, uh, give us more information about the type of comparison that's being made or the scenario in which they're talking about, then we can discuss what's going on at hand. In this case, they're just saying, what is a better weapon, a battle axe or a sword? This is like asking, what's better, a spoon or a screwdriver? There is no way to answer that. If you need a screwdriver, a spoon will not help you. If you need a spoon to drink soup, a screwdriver will not help you. The same is true for a battle axe or a sword. Battle axes can do things that swords cannot, and vice versa. So if you need one, you can use the other less effectively to try and do the same job, but uh, one is not inherently superior to the other. Next question, number four. What would a sword made with modern science and technology be like? We can answer this in part. Um, swords continue to be made in the modern day. Uh, swords, this, the, what is likely to be asked by this is, would a sword made using modern technology look radically different or behave radically different to swords in the past? The, the, answer is, for the most part, they would not look particularly different because the look of a sword is dependent on more than just changes in material science. In some cases, yes, um, the change in technology, either in the materials that a certain culture had available to them, improvements in smithing technology, um, refinement allowed them to make different types of swords, either with longer, more narrow, more skinny blades, or just put more faith in their metallurgy, uh, allowed them to create more flexible designs. So there were sometimes um, uh, breakthroughs in technology that allowed new designs to occur, but the largest pressures for what caused a sword to look the way it did were cultural conventions. Uh, things like fashion, things like what had they been doing before? Um, what was the king wearing at that point? That's what made a sword look the way it did. That's why Japanese swords continued to look the way Japanese swords did across hundreds of years and not the way that European swords or 
Thai swords or Indian swords looked, not because of differences in, in technology. So uh, modern science and modern technology could improve the function of a sword. If a sword made using modern technology, which are done, um, they use, use high carbon steel, create swords that have much less um, occurrence of uh, impurities in, in the steel that's being used in the blades. And as a result, the uh, likelihood of failure for those blades is uh, significantly less. So for instance, if you made a batch of a thousand swords using modern technology and a batch of a thousand swords in, let's say, the technology of the, the 13th century, the thousand swords from back in the day are going to have a much higher rate of failure than the modern made swords. Now, what they're going to look like is entirely up to whichever shop is, is producing them. Um, so modern technology will factor into the end results of how they will look much less. In fact, in many cases, um, modern smiths, you can look at uh, Dr. Um, Cognac, Dr. Um, or, or uh, Peter Johnson, um, and any of the, the famous um, makers who are producing them now, they will laud many of the, uh, the famous masters of old for the spectacular designs that were able to be produced in the centuries uh, and centuries past. Um, that's not to say that new designs aren't still being produced. There are beautiful, absolutely gorgeous um, pieces of art that are being created now. Uh, the work by Patrick Barda, uh, Vince Evans, um, many um, accomplished smiths today are producing, reproducing old swords using new technology and looking gorgeous and even inventing new swords. Um, Reflections, the, uh, the exhibit by Peter Johnson in particular, explores different ideas of what swords could look like as just pieces of art rather than based on any one historical design. And they take inspiration from what worked on swords before. So they are still functional as swords, but they are not reproducing any one sword from any one particular culture in the past. So a sword using modern science and technology will be more consistent and less likely to fail than one in the past, but what it will look like will be entirely dependent on who is ordering it and what culture um, today, uh, what the needs of the culture are. Swords are not used for war today, so there's no need to have a military sword of today. All right, question number, I think we're on number five. I'll say it's number five. What is your favorite sword and why? My favorite sword is probably the Turco-Mongol saber. It's an obscure type of sword. It's not very popular right now. Uh, the reason why is because when I was first looking into uh, the origins of the saber, it was very difficult to find information about it. And as a result, I've done a lot of research on Turco-Mongol sabers, the sabers of the nomadic Turkic tribes that stretched all across Asia uh, for centuries and centuries. And there's a variety of different types of them, but they're all very cool. And they gave birth to many, many different families of swords and their impact was felt from Eastern Europe to Siberia, to China, to India, to Iran, to North Africa, to the Middle East. Okay, question number six. Avengers Endgame spoilers. What is Thanos sword made from that it could break Captain America's shield? I don't know. Question number seven. Why were most Indian and Middle Eastern swords curved, but European swords straight edged? This is a misunderstanding. Curved swords appeared in Europe and curved swords appeared in India and the Middle East. Straight swords appeared in Europe and straight swords appeared in India and the Middle East. When this comparison is being made, it is usually being made between later period Indian and Middle Eastern swords and earlier period European swords. Earlier period European swords, let's say from the 11th through 16th century, so the middle, mid medieval period, are predominantly straight and double-edged, things like the arming sword and the long sword. 
They are from the medieval period. There were curved swords, but they were less common, apparently. Uh, work on the falchion will have to explain why uh, single-edged swords were not as common, at least in Western Europe. But there were straight swords in India in the Middle East uh, during this time. The most common type of sword, which is called a saif, was straight and double-edged at this same period in time. Curved swords did become more popular as more Turkic influence came into the Middle East. Uh, that started around the time of the Mongol conquest and continued to become more and more prevalent, um, finally kind of solidifying itself with the rise of the Ottoman Turks uh, starting in the 15th century. So by the time that you are starting to look into the 15th, 16th, 17th century, it's true. The Middle East and India have a predilection for curved sabers. The Tolwar, the curved saif, the uh, shamshir, the kilic. These are all curved swords. They did have straight swords as well, but those are the more popular ones used by the ruling classes and the cavalry and um, all of the... Uh, you could say, most notable warriors of, of these uh, empires. But by that time, you had lots of sabers being used in the West as well. Um, the hussars and the, uh, the, the winged hussars of Poland and uh, in Hungary were, were starting to take off. And not too long after, uh, Western Europe was starting to use single-edged arms as well. So this question suggests that there is a big difference. But if we look at history. You'll find straight blades in Middle East and India, and you'll find curved blades in Western Europe. So it's a bit of a wash. It's just some are more famous in one area than other, and they're usually at different periods of time. Question number eight. Why did swords have such basic shapes compared to swords in games and anime? Swords and games in anime usually are very exaggerated. Oftentimes, this is due to being able to do what we call read well on camera. It's something that happens with almost any type of art form. So whether you're drawing a comic, whether you're shooting a movie, whether you're shooting a TV show, it's very different than if you're trying to create something for war. And if you need your character to be recognizable, amidst thousands of extras or to be seen very easily a thousand feet away, they need to stand out and be instantly spotted no matter who they are, whether you're when you're trying to sell one comic in a whole store full of comic books. So whoever is designing that character, be it a sketch artist or be it a costume designer, has to create an iconic look for our hero. All right. That was question number eight. Let's see number nine. What is the best type of sword, saber, scimitar, etc., in the world? Again, there is no best sword. There might be a best sword for a given situation, but there's no such thing as a best sword. That is a concept of video games, role playing games, and the like. Um, there's also no such thing thing as a scimitar. I post swords has a great video explaining why. I recommend you check that out. Question number 10. How difficult is it to use a sword effectively? Now this question will vary tremendously depending both on which sword you have because there's thousands of different types of sword across thousands of years of the various cultures on Earth's history and also on the different um, types of um, fencing, the different approaches to using the sword, because even a given sword can have multiple schools of use, even within the same country at the same time. Um, in general, with a given sword, you could have someone learn to use it without injuring themselves after just a pretty short period of, of use. Um, even a, a couple of hours, you're going to be able to uh, allow them to not uh, hurt themselves. Um, being able to to stay at it for longer, if they haven't a background in some other type of combat art, um, any type of martial art, any type of boxing, any anything that requires a resisting opponent, some of that will 
carry over. Um, even better would be some type of actual uh, other uh, weapon discipline, even something like Olympic fencing or, or kendo. Uh, that's going to help them in training whatever type of sword art they have. Um, but basically, um, the the longer that they spend with the sword, the more proficient they will become. Now, how good do you want to become at it? This is like saying, how long does it take to get good at, at tennis, for instance? Um, the longer you practice, the better you're going to get. So someone who has a week's worth of training with a sword will be significantly better and would fare better against someone who was just given a sword with no instruction at all and will probably be able to hand, handle themselves uh, better, but will still probably uh, not fare very well against uh, a seasoned opponent who's been practicing it for, for years and years. So it's a, a, a continual path uh, once you start upon a given art. Uh, question number 11. What was the superior sword, the European longsword or the katana? This is a common question. It has no answer. Um, but I want to get into why this question comes up all the time. The whole reason that this question is asked over and over, there, there's a couple of reasons why this question is asked over and over. Um, one is because they're both very popular, katana, longsword. They are in the public stream of consciousness a lot. But another question, another reason that this comes up all the time is the weapons actually occupy very similar spaces in their respective culture, both being two-handed, um, both being here. Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pull them off the wall. Both being two-handed, both um, being weapons of a kind of knightly class, both being worn on and off the battlefield, um, both uh, ha are being around the same size. They're not super huge field swords. They're not you know, single-handed swords, having similar techniques, etc. The only reason that this question even exists is the weapons are actually much, much more similar in what they can and can't do than they are different. If the question was, what is superior, a long sword or a Japanese tanto, a short knife, you know, which would you prefer to have in a fight? most people are going to say the, the larger weapon. If the question was instead, what's, what's better to have in a fight, uh, a katana or a Swiss Dagon, again, most people are going to favor the, the two-handed weapon. The reason that this question even comes up over and over time again is because you're talking about two weapons where the, the differences are so small that it's going to be something that you're constantly asking well, who do you who do you think's going to come out on top? And there really is no answer. Um, the, there, there's no way to say one is is superior than the other. They they both have pluses and minuses. Having a single edge over a, a double edge, having a long cross over a, a discard, um, being being shorter and and thicker over longer and and thinner, being more emphasized on the thrust, being more emphasized on the cut. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. Both of them are compromised designs. Both are convenient to wear. Both served each respective culture for a long period of time. Both were very popular and both were very effective. All right. Um, question number 13. What is the greatest sword fight in movie history? The duel on the cliffs of insanity in The Princess Bride. Question number 14. Is a titanium sword better than steel swords? No. I don't have the smithing background to explain everything, but the very short explanation is, as it stands right now, uh, high carbon steel is the best material for making the vast majority of the shapes that sword blades come in. And again, there are many, many different types of sword designs, but the combination that you need for length, flexibility, elasticity, hardness, the ability to retain an edge, you need steel in order to do that. Titanium does not have the mechanical properties that are required to do it. It's nice to be ha have something light and strong, but it does not have all of the physical properties that are required to make sword blades. I can't speak to knives or other type of 
weapons, so you'll have to talk to someone else on if you could make a titanium spearhead, for example. Number 15, I think. In ancient sword fights, how common were instant amputations of limbs, such as legs or decapitation by sword blow? Which swords were capable of such? I don't know how ancient ancient gets, but the very oldest swords, if we're talking about Copper Age and Bronze Age, were not really cutting weapons. They were most. They started off as basically long daggers, and um, their designs are often have a very strong midrib, which have kind of narrow edges. So the first, the very first types of swords, especially in like the Mediterranean world, tended to be um, thrusting weapons. And they wouldn't be very particularly great at, at chopping. Very quickly thereafter, we do develop chopping swords, the, probably the most famous of which are things like uh, leaf-bladed designs and also uh, the sickle swords and kopesh that you find in Mesopotamia and eventually in Egypt. Um, those swords are capable of um, taking off a limb. Uh, you'd have to you'd have to get a good shot. Um, so it's not to say that every strike would equal one limb removed, but uh, they certainly could. Uh, going into the Steel Age, um, absolutely. So all the all the, the beginnings of the Iron Age and into the Steel Age, you have things like the the falcata. Um, you have the the gladius. Um, if you look into uh, the the east, you have the um, single-edge dao, ziba dao, um, in Han China, you have um, the uh, chokuto in Japan. All of these are blades that are more than capable of taking off a limb um, or causing a decapitation if you get it just right at, at the neck. Um, how often it happened? I'd have to leave that one to the, the historians, but there are plenty of very graphic accounts uh, from arc, from contemporary artwork showing loss of heads, loss of limbs. Usually, I'd say that that's more commonly seen on uh, prisoners and already um, uh, opponents who can't defend themselves. So, so people who have already fled the the field of battle, retreating or have surrendered. So, uh, it's easier against a static target than an unwilling opponent. Chat number uh, sixteen. What was the last battle? that was fought with swords. I think the spirit of this question is, when was the last time swords were used in a uh, military setting? Um, through World War II, for sure, um, swords were, were still in use. Um, you have uh, all sorts of encounters with uh, Chinese and, and Japanese engaged in, in very vicious hand, hand fighting, um, naval doctrine, um, uh, for Americans, British, uh, other Europeans continuing to use uh, uh, um, cutlasses um, on their ships, even if it, it didn't come to the use of cutlasses, they were trained in and carried uh, cutlasses uh, through the, the 1930s. Um, the, the longest used sword uh, was the Dutch Kluwang, which uh, continued to be used into the 1960s, so long after the uh, World War II period although I don't know that it saw any action on an actual battlefield uh, sort of situation. Okay, question number 15. It's the zombie apocalypse. You are given your choice of sword as your only weapon. What type of sword do you choose? Aha, so they specify that you need to use a sword as a weapon. A sword would not be my first choice in a zombie apocalypse, even carrying... Something like a, a crowbar would probably come in much more useful than a sword in a zombie apocalypse. But that's the question. Um, what sword would you choose? If I had to choose a, a sword in a zombie apocalypse, I would choose one of two approaches. Either I'd want a sword that could keep zombies very far away from me. Something like here. <sighs> Something like this, something like a Changdao, that could I could sweep and keep the zombies very far away from me, 
take out multiple zombies at a time. But that would be for a very specific type of scenario, probably where I'm defending uh, a position against like waves of zombies, and I'm probably going to end up not surviving the the, the circumstance. So that's the kind of doomsday sort of scenario. Um, in in practice, I'd probably want to choose something like this. I'd probably choose something like a a lungs messer, uh, which is very easy to carry around all the time, um, and has a big choppy fast blade that um, that I might be able to to double up and use as a tool. Uh, push comes to shove, so I I'd say of, at least of my swords, I'd use a lungs messer. I might want to choose a cutlass that has a little bit more hand protection, um, if I could just choose from any sword in the whole world. Okay, uh, that's chapter, uh, that was question number 16. Number 17, what type of metal can be used to make a sword? Um, historically, there were pretty much only four metals, and I will have my buddy I post swords and a few of my other more knowledgeable friends double check me on this. But um, off the top of my head, I can think of pretty much four swords, at least as far as the blades of the swords were concerned. Um, copper, originally, then what we will call copper alloy, but were effectively bronze swords, then iron swords, and finally steel swords. So those are the kind of four different chapters of swords developmental history. Um, other materials and other metals could go into making the hilts and scabbards and, and other components, most notably silver and gold and electrum and, and things like that. Number 17. Um, what is a better weapon? A sword or a gun? Again, it depends. If you need to do something gun related, a gun is better. If you need to do something sword related, a sword is better. In the modern day, swords have no martial purpose and are really luxury items. So most people today would say guns are superior because swords are really there as objects of beauty and things to study. Um, so as far as a better weapon is concerned, in the present day, no one is going to say sword because swords don't have any any purpose. But there might be some unusual circumstance where you could find that a sword... I'd, I'd prefer to have a sword than a gun if I only had a limited amount of ammo, for instance. Uh, number 18. Would a, the samurai sword be the sharpest blade in existence? <laughs> the mythos of the katana is in part a result of, of the way that the Japanese preserve their blades spectacularly, um, the actual properties of the sword. Um, some of the, the myths that have grown up around the swords that the Japanese themselves will perpetuate, and unfortunately just crazy things that uh, pop culture, movies, anime, comic books, etc. Um, perpetuate, and the rare uh, exaggerated war story, etc. Um, samurai swords, Uchikatana, Danto, uh, Kodachi, Wakazashi, etc., are nice blades, and they have a fine point, but sharpness is determined by two things. It's determined by the final edge geometry, so the angle at which the two sides of a blade meet, and th that'll de determine how sharp anything is. And then the steel used in the heat treatment will determine how long it stays sharp. Um, some Japanese swords can be particularly fine and particularly sharp, but not uh, not necessarily anything out of the uh, out of the ordinary compared to what is found, for instance, in in Europe. If you compared them, if you put an average Japanese sword um, against a whole bunch of different European blades. Uh, that angle, that steepness of, of edge is not going to be anything out of the ordinary. What would be unusual is both the hardness. They tend to be a little bit harder um, that on the edge than most European uh, swords, for instance, of the same time period. Let's compare, let's say, a, 14th, a 13th or 14th century Japanese sword to the same 
period um, European sword. Um, and the fact that, um, that, well, yeah, so essentially that's it. So they, they have a, a very steep edge that's polished, which helps refine and keep it at, at, a, at a steep um, final angle. And uh, the, the edge is kept at a higher hardness, which means it's allowed to stay sharp for longer. Now, in the later period, so let's leave those middle uh, medieval period swords behind, um, going into the 19th century, you had them meeting um, military sabers from Europe, and those sabers ended up having issues retaining their sharpness because of the scabbards they were kept in. So they were often kept in metal scabbards, and those metal scabbards wore down the edge. So not only were they using a softer steel in the European swords, the, that edge was constantly abrading every time it was drawn out of the scabbard, and so the edge would wear down. The Japanese swords instead were being kept still in a wooden scabbard, much like you would find in older period uh, European swords. Um, so as a result, not only was it uh, a sharp and a hard edge, it was being much better preserved. So by contrast, by the time Japan was opening up its borders again in the uh, middle of the 19th century, um, there are plenty of accounts of Europeans commenting on how amazingly sharp the Japanese blades are, but that's because they are comparing them to European swords of the time, which had some failings, unfortunately. Um, so would the samurai sword be the sharpest in blade in existence? No. Uh, number 19. Is, the, is that true that the samurai sword is much lighter, deadlier, and more accurate than the heavier sword of the Western world that's been used by knights since the ancient and medieval days? No. The samurai sword is not lighter, deadlier, or more accurate. And the Western sword is not heavier than the ancient and medieval days. They are both of similar length, similar weight, and equally deadly. You can find variation in both. You can find really, really big Japanese swords that are heavier than European swords. You can find really, really small samurai swords that are smaller than European swords. Japanese swords tend to be a little bit stiffer and a little bit thicker than uh, similar sized European swords, but it varies. Again, it depends on time. Japanese have huge conservation in design philosophy. So the same type of sword was used for hundreds and hundreds of years. In Europe, we have uh, a lot more change in um, sword de design as we go through the centuries, especially once we hit the 16th century. Um, number 19, is dual wielding swords actually possible? Yes, it is. It is usually much harder than using a single sword or using a sword and a shield or using a sword with two hands. So most schools do not teach it, or if a school does teach it, it's a very advanced sort of uh, technique, and only for certain situations. So dual wielding swords is possible. It offers a few advantages. Uh, one advantage is if you can't carry a big shield around with you, you can have two swords, either in one scabbard or in two scabbards. And then if you encounter something such as a person with a big axe or a halberd or a spear, then you have two swords to defend yourself instead of just one sword and an empty hand. Um, you can also fight two swords against someone with one sword. So there are advantages to that. But again, it's difficult. It is more complicated. It is not for all types of swords. But two rapiers were used, two side swords were used, two jian from um, China, two dao from China were used, uh, two uh, katana from, uh, from Japan were used. So Yes, dual wielding swords is possible. Number 19. Am I allowed to carry a samurai sword? I don't know who you are, so I don't know. Number 20. Uh, are swords actually useful in modern war? No. Uh, it's, a sword is no longer considered a useful item in modern war. The only thing that comes close is I know that in the Philippines, they still train with some of their... <laughs> Essentially, they're large knives, but, but some of the, um, the uh, Filipino special forces, some of their Marine Corps train in the use of uh, some of their very long knives, which are arguably short swords. I don't know of any accounts of them actually being used in earnest in combat. So that is the closest I have heard of them being used in modern war. Again, 
to the best of my knowledge, the last uh, military swords were phased out of the Dutch military in the 1960s. Okay. 21. Can we make sh swords sharper and more durable today than the ancient samurai swords? We covered this in part previously. Yes, we can. Today's materials work superior to those of the ancient past. That includes samurai swords. It's worth noting that any swords made today in Japan have to be done by uh, licensed smiths in order to be Nihonto, swords, uh, Japanese swords, and uh, that they are done using the traditional meth methods, using traditional tamahagane uh, steel collected from um, the original uh, iron deposits in Japan, so that they are uh, functionally very similar to uh, tr to original um, samurai swords. And again, they're perfectly good. Number 22. How long does a sword fight last? It can be very short or it can take a long time. Uh, historical accounts show sword fights that can last several minutes, but a sword fight can be ended in a single stroke. So it can be anywhere from one blow to several minutes long. Number 23, what was the advantage of using one-handed swords over two-handed swords? One-handed sword allows a free hand and is smaller than a two-handed sword. Two-handed swords are big and heavier and don't allow you to protect yourself. So the advantage of a one-handed sword is you get a shield. You get to protect yourself, which is tremendous. And then you have a single-handed sword to maneuver around the other shield and s smash yourself. On a battlefield, that makes a big difference. Having a shield means you stay alive a lot longer because you have the shield to protect yourself against missile weapons, which were probably the uh, the number one killer of the majority of, of massed troops, uh, either, either slings or arrows or um, crossbows or what have you, even just rocks being dropped on you. Uh, if you were in big pitched battles once upon a time, that was what's going to injure or take you out of the battle first. So having a shield is a good way to greatly increase your likelihood of survival. Um, so have a shield in one hand and then have a sword in the other hand. Two-handed sword use is very closely tied with the use of heavy armor. Um, for instance, in China, um, you have the state of Chu um, it, during the Warring State period through the beginnings of the Han Dynasty, so even before the time of Christ, so starting around uh, the second century um, BC, um, they had very heavy configurations of rhinohide armor and were able to produce two hand, very long two-handed Jian swords uh, for use. Um, we didn't see the same type of two-handed swords come into use until about the, the middle of the 13th century in, in Europe. Um, but again, that happened around the same time that heavier and heavier configurations of armor uh, happen. So you don't need to have your armor on your hand anymore. You can wear your armor on your body. It frees up the second hand to be able to use the sword. Um, question number 24. What's the best material to use for making a sword? We covered this in part. It's steel. Question 25. Who made the best swords in the past? So, this is a little too open-ended, and again, it's just asking for the best swords. But in rather than any one location or place in time, so whether you're looking at Indian swords, or whether you're looking at Arabian swords, or African swords or European swords, anywhere you go, you will always find a spectrum of quality of swords. You will find very simple swords that are oftentimes mass-produced to be able to very quickly equip a large number of troops. You will find kind of medium level of swords that are common, but not as common as the really low-grade swords that are sometimes village swords or militia swords that are just kind of ham hammered together that you will see very, very frequently that are of um, consistent configurations and that are, are well-dressed but not too well-dressed. And then you will find beautifully crafted, high-quality swords that very quickly turn into a, a piece of, of jewelry. Now, these jewelry... Um, 
type of swords have not lost their functionality in almost every cases. It's very easy to think that just because the sword is covered in gems and gold, that it is no longer uh, a, a weapon that can be used. In many cases, that was not the case at all. It was, even though it was part of someone's um, attire, is part of, of someone's robes and crowns and, and rings and, and went along with their entire kit, it still had operated as a sword perfectly well and was expected to be able to do its job. Um, so within each culture, you could expect to find a, a variety of different smiths and a variety of different um, uh, qualities of sword production. Okay, and the final question. Aren't swords essentially bad weapons? There's no follow-up here, but there's been a recent trend online that I've seen recently that has gone something like this. Um, hey, you know, more people were equipped with and used spears than swords throughout history, so clearly the spear is the superior weapon. Or, you know, the longbow was what won battles, not, not the sword. So a sword is a pretty rubbish weapon, just because... Uh, modern media mythologizes swords, um, you know, it, it really wasn't that common. It, that, that's a, uh, an, an artificial anachronism from Hollywood, and swords were not ever used on the battlefield at all. That's kind of um, having the pendulum swing too far the, in the other direction. In the context of a pitched battle, it is true that most troops, most infantry, most cavalry, w what have you, would not use a sword as their primary weapon. Um, instead, they're going to either be missile troops, as we previously discussed, have some type of projectile, or they're going to have some type of a pole arm, be it a, a halberd, an axe, a spear, something with a very long reach, or they're going to be mounted troops. However, all of these types of troops will almost always have one, if not two, backup weapons. One of those weapons will be a short knife or dagger, and the other weapon will be a sword. The sword will stay on that person's hip as a, a personal sidearm. And once the primary weapon is expended, especially if you're a, a, someone like an archer or a longbowman, um, once you have used up all of those, or once the enemy closes rank with you, you are not going to be using that bow anymore. You are going to drop the bow, and you are going to pull out your sword to defend yourself. As a result of this, even though you have all these spearmen, all these bowmen, all these cavaliers with their lances on the field, let's say you have 30, 30, and 30 for 90 total, you will have 90 swords to your 30 bows, 30 lances, and uh, 30 spears. There may be more swords on your battlefield at any moment than any one other weapon. You might have more ammunition for your crossbows or, or arrows for your for your um, bowers, uh, for your bowmen, but uh, swords will be almost ubiquitous. And this is true of almost since their inception across almost all cultures, all the way through their historical use. So it's true in a from a battlefield context, and then doubly so once you get into a civilian context, because in many cases, you cannot go around town carrying a spear. You will not be able to have a shield in town. You will not be able to bring your crossbow with you. But a lot of times, you can carry a sword. Sometimes you couldn't. Sometimes you could only have a, a large knife. Um, there are laws depending on which country and which time period we're talking about. So sometimes swords were are restricted to a certain class or a certain group of individuals. But in many cases, swords were something that you could carry on your person. And if you need to travel from town to town to protect yourself, you brought your sword with you. So in addition to all the other roles that a sword played in society, um, be it the role that it had in the religion, the role that it had in signifying who you were, um, the, the role that it, uh, it had in, in dictating uh, what part of society you played, at the end of the day, the sword was still there as a means not only for offense, which is what most people think of, but as a means of personal defense. It, a sword is much better at being used uh, for keeping someone alive than almost any other hand weapon. It's much better 
at pr protecting yourself from attack than uh, something like a mace or an axe or a pick uh, that are very good at delivering a heavy blow but not very good at warding and, and counterattacking, which is where a sword shines. So that's all that we have for, for this time. So thank you very much for sticking through to the end. I hope you had as much fun as I did. This is pretty good. We might make a, 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 a series of this. So if, uh, if you have the opportunity to just stick with, uh, to, to just make one subscription today and want to subscribe to one channel that answers questions from Quora, make sure you subscribe to Ramsey Dewey. But if you want to hear about more swords, then come back and visit us here sometime. All right. Take care, guys.